into God's family at the moment of our salvation. We become part of God's family. And it's an important doctrine that to wrap our heads around, and, and we've forgotten a lot of it in our conversation of salvation. We've forgotten that we are actually adopted into God's family. And even on our, our Facebook invite and all this kind of stuff, we put out, you know, we are all God's children. It was going to be the title of today's message. But a couple days ago, uh, I talked with Pastor Tom, and he wanted us to change our approach this morning. That the Spirit was moving us to cover another aspect of what happens at the moment of our salvation. And when you are adopted into God's family, you identify with Him. And if you have your packets, this is going to be worth me rephrasing just the heading. Verse number 23 says, A Heavenly Association. We're going to be calling it identity. You identify with Christ. At the moment of your salvation, you are now identified with Christ. And this identity over the course of history, and in some places today, has been one that is costly. It's cost people relationships with their families. It's cost people their jobs, their livelihood. And in some places over history and still now, it cost people their lives. And what prompted us to change our message was a speech given by the president, sitting president of the United States where he surrounded himself with Marines in a blood, blood red background and proclaimed that if you're against abortion, adding that if you're against uh, homosexual unions, that you're a, quote, extremist and a, quote, enemy to the republic. It's interesting that when he spoke on marriage, he said, marrying them who you love, which begs the question, if a grown man loves or claims to love a five-year-old boy, would we not stop this union? Would we not step in and stop this? Later on in his speech, he called all those who still follow him to confront and speak out against those, quote, extremists, which he takes as the biblical worldview. This very same language just years ago was used against terrorists. Those very same speeches that used that language is what prompted me to join the military and made me proud to serve our country. And now it is dictated towards those who hold the biblical worldview. Well, this is not any new news, but it's still alarming coming from the supposed leader of our nation. A man who will ignore the Constitution on a whim and declare what he wants, says that those who hold to a biblical definition of life, about abortion, and a biblical definition of marriage are now enemies of the nation. A people who do not want to see the murder of children are now enemies. So, so what do we make of this? What, what do we Christians make of this? What do, we, what do we think about being called extremists for our biblical stance? What are we to make of a culture that encourages the murder and mutilation of children in a world that loves to question our identity? Our question is, with who or with what do we identify? 
at the moment of salvation, you now stand with Christ, the King of the universe. He is your identity. He is the King. And so turn in your Bibles if you went to Romans chapter 1. That's Romans chapter 1. And what I want to do this morning is I want to walk through what Scripture says about where our culture is. I want to walk through what Paul is writing to the Romans here in the first chapter of his book. And, and he's showing them where they were, which is where we are now. Nothing is new under the sun. I want to point out what God and his sovereignty has allowed to happen. And then I want to show you God's response. God's response to this. And then our response that is to follow. So this is our society through the lens of scripture. Romans 1, starting in verse 18. For the wrath of God was revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident to them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has made them, so that they are without excuse. Our first observation we can make from this text is that what is to follow is the wrath of God. It is judgment. And in the same verse, Paul describes who the wrath is being poured out on. All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Paul describes that God is evident to them through creation and through the natural attributes that he throws, excuse me, shows through creating the world, yet they suppress it. And because they suppress God's revelation in their foolishness, God says they're without excuse. If you look at the complexity of nature and all that God's provision is it, in it, it's hard to deny. It's hard to deny a, sun, a sunrise or a sunset and the beauty that you see in that and know that it is from God. Yet, a lot of schools, education systems, even when I was going through school, it wasn't too long ago, some Christian schools work very hard to suppress that truth. Every time the illogic and really stupidity of evolution is brought up and challenged, they just add another million years to the equation. Nothing plus nothing equals everything, they say. This evolutionary idea was started by a man named Charles Darwin, who saw what we would call microevolution, and because of this, had a theory that species actually went from one species to the next. Well, the Word of God not only rejects this outright, but explains why what we call microevolution happens. And that's because God in his sovereign hand is so caring towards his creation that he will make adjustments because his hand is so involved in nature. He loves not only us, but he loves his creation that much to help them survive when he seems fit. Evolutionary system is not a way to explain the origins of our world but it is a way to erase God from it. If you erase God from creation, then you will not have to answer to him for following your sinful desires and not repenting from them. If we can take God out of the beginning, we can take God out of the end. And we can just be pieces of meat that live through our lives with no consequences. But God will not be mocked. Continuing in verse 21 to 23, for even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give thanks. For they became futile in their thoughts and foolish in their heart. It was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the likeness of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Here Paul continues to speak on this issue, continues to speak on people just suppressing what God says about himself, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. It is impossible to do this, and eventually man must reconcile that there is a God. By doing this, they come up with sophisticated sounding systems, trying to sound wise and intelligent. But as Proverbs 1-7 says, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. 
Ignorant fools despise wisdom and discipline. They have no fear of our God. It's amazing how accurate the scriptures are here. It says, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God with the image and the likeness of corruptible man, of, of birds and four-footed animals and of crawling creatures. This is the thought that creation created itself that we see. That we came from monkeys and it just happened over time. They worship the creature that created, they think created itself. They throw God out and make creation create itself. And this is exactly what Paul is saying, that it is foolishness. And for that, in verse 24, we see God's judgment. Therefore, verse 24, therefore God gave them over in the lust of their heart to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. To understand this more fully, we want to read this in the light of Proverbs 29, 2, where it says, When the righteous increase, the people are glad. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Society embraces righteousness, they will prosper. But when society does not, they will groan. And they will continue to push and people chase after the lust of their own heart. And God makes them and judges them. When people reject God's law of righteousness and governing their lives, he lifts his restraining hand. This in Proverbs 29, just the verse before it says, A man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond healing. When society refuses the discipline that God is putting on them to lovingly draw him back to himself, and they will not listen, he will lift his restraining hand. And he does not release more discipline, he releases wrath and judgment. And so often we make the mistake of just thinking that God's wrath was simply a flood, or simply fire and brimstone. Or a natural disaster. And that has to be the wrath and judgment of God. But we forget the example of Israel that the Bible gives us. For what other aspects of God's judgment are. It is so much more. And this first restraint that is lifted, we see here in verse 24 and 25. And what that is, is, is God lifts the, the, they deny, God lifts these guardrails of keeping sexual activity between God's uh, design of a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage. They chase the lusts after their heart. They bow, they go boom, boom, boom against God's hand, and he lifts it, and he lets them chase what they want, and they die deeper and deeper and deeper into their lust. They know it's wrong, but they rush in the excitement of their flesh and feel encouraged to dive deeper into their sin, to drown out what they already feel. We see that they worship the creature rather than the creator. And in our nation, sexual activity is worshipped. Men worship the female body, not because they hold women in such high regard, but because they can use it to please themselves. Women buy into this lie and, and feel they, to be empowered by giving into this worship, but in reality, what they're doing is they're changing, being in the value, the value of being made in the image of God, they become a fresh piece of meat. That once it's wrinkled, it will be thrown away by its worshiper and replaced by a younger version. Unlike God's word that never fades, the body fades. Continuing in verse 26 and 27, for this reason God gave them over to dishonorable passions, for their females exchanged natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also males abandoned the natural function of females and burned in their desire toward one another. Males with males committing indecent acts and receiving in their own person the due penalty for their error. Again, we see this phrase, God gave them over. It's as if they've hit the other wall, this other wall that God is using to restrain, and they keep pounding against it, and God lifts his hand, removes his preventing hand, and lets them chase what they want. It seems like there are certain lines that shouldn't be crossed, and when they are, God removes his staying power and unleashes what they want. 
He gives them over to homosexual sin. That second restraint is a homosexual revelation, or excuse me, revolution. And we see that God gives them over to this unnatural thing. Homosexuality is a sin. It is a choice. Just like if we were to give into heterosexual lust, prevent heterosexual sin, it is a sin nonetheless. It is a sin that is perverse. And, and it's more prevalent in societies that have rejected God. 20 years ago, this wasn't an issue. 20 years ago, we didn't see this insanity. But as they push and push and push against God, he lifts his hand, as we've seen. We're also seeing teachers, some teachers, not all, indoctrinating our children into the ways of the flesh, to turn them over, to just accept this perversion. They, they, want, they want us to live in a society where we accept sin. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And what does it mean where it says receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error? I believe what we are seeing here is AIDS, monkeypox, sexually transmitted diseases. God forgives sin for those who repent. He's forgiven all of us of our sin if we turn to him. However, there are still consequences for our sin in the day to day. Either our judgment for our sins are taken out on us at the judgment seat or on Christ on the cross. But in this life, sins that I've committed, I still suffer some consequence even though they've been forgiven. Consequences are part of actions. And this is what we see here. And unfortunately, a lot of sins affect others as well, even our own children. Sin brings forth death, is what the scripture says. And it does this in so many ways. Continuing in verse 28 through 31. And just as they did not see it fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to an unfit mind to do those things which are not proper. Having been filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, violent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, Disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. This is the third restraint. An unfit mind. After willing disobedience and refusal for a society to live as God would have them, he finally lifts this up. So that way they corrupt their own mind. All this happens to both individuals and society. And we are seeing people with an unfit mind running our country, are we not? Leaders who, who cannot even define out of either fear or ignorance what a woman is. A very basic one-on-one -on -one question. But they're unwilling to define it, either because they don't know or they're afraid. Transgenderism is having an unfit mind. Being born a male and imaginably thinking you're a female, it's, it, it's utter insanity. And if you speak out against it, you're at risk of being ostracized in your society, having your business shut down, people protesting, being an enemy of the state, as we were told on Thursday. We're all supposed to sit here and ignore the truth. Ignore what is basic and evident. We're all supposed to suppress the truth in unrighteousness, like the rest of our society, but we will not. The people of God cannot do this. We will not sit back and watch doctors pray on our children. To, to tell them that they're the opposite sex and then take a knife and mutilate them in the name of science. No. This is a bridge too far. We cannot allow this to happen. Yet, when, when they have been given over to a corrupt mind and this insanity that follows, 
We're all supposed to close our eyes and go back to the darkness. But, but we learn in Scripture that Christ came to give sight to the blind. That Satan blinds people. He blinds them to the truth. But our eyes have been opened because of Christ. And because of his word. Our eyes have been opened. And we cannot go back to blindness. Satan can no longer blind our hearts to this perversion. And more than just transgenderism, we see a mental health crisis in cases on the rise. We see it all the time at the Niagara Gospel Mission. All the time. People struggling with anxiety, depression, suicide, on the rise. All of this is skyrocketing. And as our culture pushes against God and encourages those to go into sin to fight this feeling of lostness, we cannot keep our mouths closed. We are living in an age where, as Judges 17.6 says, everyone does what is right in their own eyes, rather than submitting to the righteous decrees of God. And we see, starting in verse 30 and 31, we, we see these things in our, in our culture. We see the things listed here in the hearts of people. Greed and envy become a political philosophy in socialism. The murder of children, both in the womb and then in schools, where we don't even keep them safe, is only becoming the norm. Our news media can be described as strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanderers, as well as our politicians. We see that more and more people are haters of God. They're inventors of evil. As people just go down the rabbit hole of sin, not only do they invent evil, but they are arrogant and boastful about it as they violently push it on others. To obey your parents is never encouraged anymore. Rather, they encourage you to go to, to someone else for everything. And, and they even try to hide it from your parents. But some, some of these things we've read of what's going, going on in some of our states, they're saying, no, don't tell your parents we're giving you this pill. What? They're pushing this on children. These people are without understanding. They're untrustworthy. They're un unmerciful. And it's all wrapped up in a big package and bow of unloving. Unloving. God defines love. Not a simple question. Folks, we are here. This is where we are. Verse 32. And although they know the righteous requirement of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. How many companies and people were forced to fly the rainbow crack the label flag, forced to say things during June for the LGBTQ plus society. Forced. Not they wanted to voluntarily, but their employees would threaten to walk out if they did not do this. Thousands of companies. How many kids had drag queens we could see these videos and pedophiles come to read to them in public schools? How many people clapped as an 11-year-old boy was dressed as a drag queen going on Good Morning America, only to have later a video surfacing of old men being inappropriate with him? And it all took a blind eye. Beloved, our society not only gives hearty approval, but forces it down your throat. And as their sin corrupts them, they will tolerate the light of the gospel less and less. They will try to snuff the light out and darken our hearts again. And now, like I said before, the President of the United States not only gives hearty approval, not only is forcing it down our throats, but calls those of us who hold what the Word of God says to be extremists and enemies of a republic. If we do not accept the murder of your child is okay, you're an enemy. If you don't want pedophiles dancing in front of your children, funded by your taxpayer dollars, you're an enemy. If you don't think a man and a woman can be married, you're an enemy. Excuse me, a man and a man. Apologize. We believe man and women should be married. <laughs> Let me rephrase that, sorry. 
And if you don't believe a man can become a woman, you're an enemy. If you believe that people should pay their own bills instead of getting it forced on others, you're an enemy. We're being called bigoted, hate-filled, fear-mongering extremists, seen as an enemy of a free society. So what do we do? As it seems as if our culture has gone down this, this river and they haven't put the anchor in to stop them, where do we go? What do we do as Christians? What are we supposed to do? We'll jump back up to verse 16 of Romans 1, where it says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Beloved, this is not a time to be ashamed of the gospel. As our world is pushing and pushing us to deny it, we must not. We can't be ashamed of what Christ has done. We can't be ashamed of what the word of God says. This is not the time to cower. No, we need to, as 1 Corinthians 1, 23 says, we preach Christ and Him crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. We call out our culture of death and tell them not only what they're doing is sin, but that there's hope. There's hope. Because as our culture's pushed down this way, they've seen there's no hope. The Bible gives hope. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That is the hope. It's our job as pastors here, as people here, to beat that gospel drum, to always point back to Christ. And, and when we're tempted to shy away, to be ashamed, when the temperature's rising and we see that Christians are being hated, we must remember that what happens at the moment of our salvation is our identity is in Christ. How we identify with him. Listen to Luke 9, 23 to 26, where it says this, And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will be saved. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his soul. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. As the temperature rises in our nation, let us remember that if we are ashamed, if we, if we cower in our cubicles, if we don't say something to our neighbors, if we don't warn them, if we don't stand for the gospel, we're at risk of Christ being ashamed of us. He is far more fearsome than anything we can face in this world. What does it gain me? What profit do I have? If I have all the favor, all the followers, all the likes, all the good nods from society, if I forfeit my soul, I spend an eternity in hell. What does it profit me? No, my identity is in Christ. We seem to be rapidly approaching a time in our nation where pick up your cross and follow me is seen in a much more literal sense. When denying ourselves makes us that enemy. But it is our identity. Those who Christ has called out from this world, we are his. We don't live for this world anymore. We're citizens of a different kingdom. John 15, 18 to 21 says this, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. 
For if they persecuted me, that is Christ, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. As a simple world rails against its enemy, which is the Bible, rails against its enemy, which is God, doesn't want to accept what God says, how we are to live our lives. We must remember that it first hated God, hated Christ, for giving them that standard, their creator. That's why people I served with in the military that I did everything for have come after me with hatred. After all I did with them, called me a bigot, a hateful person, because all I did was rejoice that Roe v. Wade was struck down on Facebook in a public square. And I all lit me of hateful messages with people I risk my life for. That's why when I say a better way to prevent becoming pregnant is to not have sex before marriage, instead of murdering your child, I get called a quote slut shamer by people I helped in multiple ways through their life. It's because the world hates Christ. And the more they, they feel they're getting away with that hatred, more comfortable they are in hating you and me. But what is God's response to all of this? Is God cowering in the clouds? Is God biting his fingernails because people are against what he says? Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 2. That's Psalms chapter 2. God is not cowering. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the people meditate on a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take their counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens is scared. No, he who sits in the heavens doesn't know what to do. No, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord mocks them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of Yahweh. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give you the nations as your inheritance, and the ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like a potter's vessel. So now, O kings, these very kings that are going against God, so now, O kings, show insight. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, that is Christ, lest he become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all those who take refuge. When the world wars against God, it wars against his people. But the Lord God laughs at their fall. The Lord mocks them. And, and, and think about this picture, if you will, that all the armies, and all the helicopters, the planes, the tanks, everything you can imagine are all amassed against one person on a hill. One person. And the, the armies of the world bring all this to them. All this to Christ and say, we're here for battle. And God laughs. And this isn't a laugh of humor. This is a laugh of, really? Really? I created you. I sustain your very breath. Yet you want a war against me. How frightful would it be? If you're an enemy there, how frightful would that be? Look at verse 6 where it says, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. That king is Christ. How, how does God go against his enemy? How does, what is God doing here? It doesn't say he breathes fire and just destroys them all. No, he says, my king is on my holy mountain. 
the, the one who was, who was ascending in a cloud to the throne room of God, after to be seated on the right hand of the Father. And he, he told his disciples and us this, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What God does to his enemies is he offers them repentance. He offers them forgiveness. We're railing against God and God saying, come to me. Those who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's saying, come to me and repent of your sin. He's not saying, I'm just going to smash you the second you sin. No, all this, all this we see so clearly, the, the world we live in, and the word of God, and that, that separation is so that we come to the love of our Father that will never leave those who are in him. That should be our reaction. That's the reaction we need to call others to. Because all authority is in this king of Zion. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And instead of just putting himself on a throne and, and demanding everything, he tells his people, us, to go into the nations. To go into America, into New York, Niagara County, Niagara Falls, wherever you're called to be, and teach people the commands of God. This is the banner we wave, wave Christ and him crucified. We say, come and repent. Come and turn from your sin. You who are living this life of just pain and misery, come to Christ. Come to Christ. This is our response. And to show more clearly our response, I want to take two characters from the Old Testament and kind of compare and contrast them as we close. The first is Jonah. Jonah was a prophet of the Lord, and he was told to go to Nineveh to warn them of the destruction that God was going to bring on them for their sin. But he refused. He tried to run. He went on a boat. And as he's sailing in the complete opposite direction, God causes a storm, so that way they would cast Jonah into the water, a fish would swallow him, until he repented. That is an amazing thought. And then would spit him out onto the ground three days later. And then he would end up going to the very city he didn't want to go to. Jonah 3, 4 to 10. Then Jonah began to go into the city one day's walk. You got to think of all the thoughts that were going through that one day. I was just in the belly of a fish. <laughs> and now I'm just going to do what the Lord tells me before a giant bird comes and swallows me up. And he called out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. This is his message. What's the reaction? And the people of Nineveh believed in God. And they called a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest to the least. Then the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, laid aside his mantle from them, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on ashes. And he cried out and said, in Nineveh, by decree of the king and his nobles, let man, animal, herd, or flock taste not taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink. But both man and animal must be covered in sackcloth, and let men call on God with their strength, and each may turn from his evil way, from the violence of their hands. And I love this here. Who knows? This is the king. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn away from his burning anger so that we will not perish. Then God saw their work. And they turned from their evil way. So God relented concerning the evil which he had spoken that he would bring upon them. And he did not bring it upon them. Because of their repentance, God stayed his wrath. God used the preaching of Jonah to call people to repentance. Because our God is a God of wrath, yes, but he's a God of mercy. He's a God of love. He's a God of forgiveness. He wants people to repent and come to him. God accomplishes his work 
through the preaching of his people. So we must be bold. We must be bold. We must not be like Jonah, who was unwilling to call people to repentance. Even afterwards, he wanted the place to be destroyed. It's really an amazing thought. Even after he preaches, Lord, I'll preach, and he sits there and waits for it to be consumed with fire. And God's like, he asked them to repent, they did. What, what, what more could you ask for? People are being saved. It's easy to see the state of our nation and the world and say, see, things are getting worse. They're getting worse and worse. Jesus is returning. So we all just hunger down and wait to get raptured and see the rest of the world perish. That's not the right response. The right response is to go into the world and preach the gospel. To go to our hurting neighbors and family and say, the Lord lovingly sent his son to die for you on a cross so that you may avoid what's coming. That's our message. Our message is not one of, you're going to die. It's one that says, our loving God wants you to repent of your sin and will embrace you into his family, will adopt you into his family. That is our message. That is our identity. And this brings us to the second character in the Old Testament, which is Noah. Noah. God tells Noah that he's going to destroy the entire earth with a flood. And then God commands him to build this massive boat. And if you ever get a chance to go down to Kentucky, you can see a life-size replica of this boat. It's the largest timber structure in all of North America. It is amazing. My wife and I, that was our honeymoon, <laughs> which I'm still paying for now. <laughs> so, massive boat. Genesis 6 through 9. God commands it. Noah does it. And he builds his ark. God seals the door and drowns everyone outside the boat. Everything outside the boat. Genesis 7, 23, thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land. From man to animal to creeping things, to birds of the sky, they were blotted out from the earth. And only Noah remained and those who were with him in the ark, which was his family. Put yourself in Noah's shoes right now. Noah's on a boat. And every children's book that covers this story has Noah smiling with all these animals and we can think, well, maybe he was taking care of the animals and shoveling, you know, after they eat. Where's he putting it? We can think of all these questions, right? Think of Noah. His work, his friends, his extended family, all that he has ever known, covered up in water. This would be the equivalent today, and some of us have experienced this, of a tornado or hurricane coming through, or a house fire. And you lose everything. You've lost your clothes, maybe some pets, pictures that you've taken over the years. You've lost everything. And, and in some cases, Lives, loved ones that were caught in the fire, that were caught in the tornado or the hurricane, they couldn't get out. That's what Noah's feeling as he's watching outside the ark the rain come. There's a shock. But the question is, is Genesis 6 22 is where he receives the command, Genesis 7 1 is when the rain starts. What happens in between that time? What happens between Genesis 6, 22 and Genesis 7, 1? Well, the answer is in 2 Peter 2, 2 to 4. And it says this, For if God did not spare angels who sinned, but cast them into the pit, and delivered them from the chains of darkness, being kept for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought the flood upon the world, of the ungodly. For 120 years, Noah went out and preached repentance. He told people that this flood is coming. I'm not building this boat for nothing. Come to God. Repent of your sin. 
And, and you may be saved, just like you see in Nineveh. Who knows? <laughs> if you may be saved, and for 120 years, no one but his family listened. No one. He preached to the people of all the earth that God was going to bring his just wrath upon them. Christ tells his disciples at this time, he says, that they were just eating, sleeping, marriage, everything was just going on as normal. Living their lives until one day it was too late. The door was sealed. We are to be preachers of righteousness in this time. That's what it means to identify with Christ. To proclaim his kingdom. Let us take the lessons from Noah, which seems to be a little opposite in who he is as a person, of Jonah. Because Jonah was forced to preach by God, swallowed by a fish, spit up three days later, right where he needed to be, just a day's walk away, so he could think about what he did. Noah preached, and no one listened. One man preaches out of pure duty, the whole city gets saved. One man preaches out of love and pleading, and only his family. When it's God's time for judgment, it's his time. We do not dictate that. That is not upon us. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't know when we're going to be driving home and hit by a car. We don't know if we're going to live to be 109 and pass away in our sleep. We don't know nor does anyone else. We also don't know when Christ is going to return. Yet, however, we're to preach the gospel in and out of season. We're to preach the gospel to everyone, not because we think we're better, because we're not. I am no better than anyone else. Neither are you. But we preach the repentance because God loves people. God wants people to be saved. We don't know how many of his people are out there. But once that last person is saved, comes the judgment. This is the only message that has hope. Let us remember that as it seems like persecution is coming, you hear the rhetoric, you look at other nations that have done the same thing, study history. Rhetoric amps up against a certain group of people, and then comes persecution. And Christians have always been in some part of that. As we see this coming, like in the days of old, and, and we even look at the Soviet Union, where, where Christians and churches were told to change their messaging. Richard Warmbrand wrote a book, uh, Torching for Christ, and that's what he says. They were told to change their messaging, and his wife nudged him and said, I didn't marry a coward. And he stood up and spent the remainder of his time in Romania and the Gulag. They would want us to change our message to appease them, but let us not be ashamed of the gospel. Let us not be ashamed of what the word of God says. Let us not shy away. Let's not cower in our cubicles. Let's be, let's be loving. Share this loving message that Christ came to die on a cross, to rise three days later, to save people from their sins. And let's lovingly do this with our friends and our family. But when we're questioned, when we're questioned by authorities, if it comes to a point where we must take an account, let us be bold as lions. Let us be men and women who are not ashamed of the gospel. Because we see in our lives, we see in others' lives, and the Word of God tells us that it is the power of salvation. Let us pray. Lord, as we, we see our nation seem to unraveling at the seams, and all of us, unless our heads buried in the sand, we see this. But Lord, let us have hope Thank you that we can identify with you. And as the Christians of old who, who when they were brought into the lion's dens of Roman cathedrals, and they stood against gladiators, 
Some of them responded in fear, yes, but some of them looked at each other and they said, how great is it that we get to share in the sufferings of Christ? Lord, if it comes to that, let us have that attitude. But Lord, also give us the encouragement and the strength to know that the, the more we preach the gospel, the more people are saved. That we can't give up. That we can't roll over. Because you're a God of victory. And you have set Christ, the King, on your holy mountain. Lord, strengthen us to be faithful to you. Strengthen us to identify with you. And we thank you so much.